Hello, this is Joseph Shore. I want to speak with you again about the death of opera as an art form. I already gave one or two videos on this, but I wanted to expand a little bit this time. Because not, it's not only you and I who have been talking about this, but major critics, major observers in the art form, and major observers in society. For example, the, the uh, excellent music critic Peter G. Davis started interest in dissecting these problems way back in 1980. And he did so in the Holy New York Times, the Sunday edition, back in April 20th, 1980. And I'm going to read a little bit of some of his very wise observations. He says, Where are the new Caruso's and Poncel's? Is it simply that extraordinary vocal power is a rarity of nature and that a Caruso comes to us only once in a century? No, say numerous impresarios, managers, voice teachers, coaches, and administrators of organizations that assist budding musical talent. Potentially great voices are reasonably common, they say, but conditions in the music world today are not conducive to their recognition and development. Indeed, in the view of one vocal authority, if a young Caruso suddenly appeared on the first rung of the professional ladder, unformed and unrefined, bursting with raw talent, he would not receive the sort of care or encouragement that would allow him to realize his full vocal or artistic capacities." End quote. And that's from the article, Where Are the Great Opera Singers of Tomorrow? from the Sunday New York Times, April 20, 1980, written by the music critic, one of the most respected in the country, Peter G. Davis. So, you see, that's what we've all been told. We go to the opera and we see that the singers can in no wise compare with the singers we have on our records or the singers that are in our memories uh, there are no Tobaldis, there are no Delmonicos, there are no Warrens, yeah. there are no Jerome Hineses. And we see this all the time. And we ask questions, and usually we're given this answer. Oh, you can't expect every generation to have that great quality of singing. Those kind of singers happen just once in a few hundred years. And that's what Peter Davis and many other people are saying is a lie. It's not true. What did he say? He said, potentially great voices are reasonably common, but conditions in the music world today are not conducive to their recognition and development. Indeed, in the view of one vocal authority, if a young Caruso appeared on the first rung of the professional ladder, unformed and unrefined, bursting with raw talent, he would not receive the sort of care or encouragement that would allow him to realize his full vocal or artistic capacities. Now, where did this all come from, really? What really got this all started? If you uh, read a very interesting book called Requiem for the American Dream by Noam Chomsky, you'll find out quite a lot about 
what took place in society. It started around the 1970s when a letter got sent, a very high profile letter got sent to all of the major uh, industries, all of the, the uh, top 500 corporations. And the letter said that American business is getting the stuffings knocked out of them by all of this democratic stuff that's going on that went on in the 60s. You know, the great hippie rebellion, the great war, anti-war protests. That was all very bad for big business. And the letter said, business has to take control of society. And that's exactly what was organized and which they began to do. And Noam Chomsky's book spells it out. This anti-intellectualism, this anti-art, was all a ploy of what Chomsky calls the ten principles of concentration of wealth and power. Now, what does this have to do with opera? Well, opera is controlled by a board. You know, there, there's a, a board of directors that controls the company. Now, who do you suppose is on the board of directors? Big businessmen. Who, who is on the, the board of directors of the Metropolitan Opera? Well, for years, it was the Rockefellers. And the rest of the board of directors were businessmen in that same highest league. In other words, the richest and the most influential businessmen in all of New York City, in all of the world. So it was not difficult to uh, make choices that would be a part of this dumbing down of society, this anti-intellectualization. Chomsky shows how this is the origin of failures in schools, why the uh, K through 12 system disintegrated into a bunch of morons. You have kids now who graduate from high school that can't read or write or can't even write their own name much less do they know anything about the art or about history. They are literally educated to be consumers, to be buyers, to buy whatever is the latest fad. And they're pushed along by advertising and social media and social pressure for the latest gadget. That was all engineered, social engineering. And what they had to do to, do to create that is to create a very dumbed down society. And art was definitely not wanted in that. Why? Because art inspires people. When people are inspired, they wish to become better. They wish to learn more. They wish to appreciate more. They become, they become self-independent, which is what a consumer society, a, a consumer society would hate the most. They want a consumer society which is essentially a mindless bunch of consumer-driven Eaters. That's what they call us, the eaters. They make the stuff, we're supposed to eat it. So, way back here in 1980, this was pointed out. Now I'm going to read some more from it. Um, he says, what the opera profession thinks it wants 
in this time of rapid regional expansion is a certain type of mechanically facile young performer, a quick study and top reader, obediently flexible in rehearsal, whose singing is neat and unthreatening, and who can be described with the oft-heard phrase, attractive, moves well, excellent diction. But we cannot care about or believe in a note they sing or a word they say for much the same reasons that in life we often do not believe or trust persons whose preoccupation is with being attractive, moving well, and possessing excellent diction. He goes on, the profession gobbles up such performers. It selects them out of the music schools, sticks them into apprentice programs, gives them grants, and employs them at successive levels. Everyone then congratulates everyone else that such an overwhelming percentage of artists having careers are graduates of the music schools, veterans of the apprentice programs, and winners of grant competitions. The system must be working. He continues, the system is working, but the performances are not. Farther along the line, even the profession picks up a whiff of something rotten as it observes that none of these promising performers can begin to meet the challenges of the great roles of the standard repertoire in large houses because the goals of our training are not right to start with and because the education system and the lower rungs of the profession are not congenial to the bigger mistakes, the more abrasive temperaments of the truly dramatic artist. As one agent put it to me a while back, if the young Caruso were trying to break into the business now, he'd flunk the, uh, the apprentice audition. And can you really Imagine Shaliapin at Indiana or Santa Fe, end quote. From the New York Times article, Where are the Great Singers of Tomorrow, April 20th, 1980. <laughs> Isn't this very interesting? Now, clear back in 1991, there was a whiff in the air that microphones were going to be coming into the opera houses. These little mediocre voices that were being hired, no one could hear them. And so instead of hiring great artists with great voices, they wanted to persist in their, their idea of ensemble opera. Ensemble opera was their name for this dumbed down opera, which did not require great voices. And in the communist ideal of the ensemble opera, every singer is to match every other singer, and no singer is to stick out over any other singer. And they're all supposed to be obediently flexible to the stage director, who's the real star now. So if the stage director says, stand on your head and sing the opera, you're supposed to do that. If he asks you to take off all your clothes, and sing uh, Jermont Naked, you're supposed to do that. And there have been plenty of instances of this stuff. But uh, clear back in 1991, Marilyn Horne saw the microphones that were coming. And she said this, The microphones are coming. It's just a matter of time before the older generation, that's us, that understands what a disaster microphones would be is safely out of the way. And when the microphones come, that'll be the ending. That'll be the beginning of the end. Who will really learn to sing? There won't be any need to. The same thing will happen to opera that we have seen happen to Broadway. That would have been in the 80s. When I was young, there were any number of well-produced attractive voices in musicals. Today, in 1991, you have George Hearn, 
maybe one or two others, and that's it. There is no market for a good sound. Well, today there's not even those, two or three. There is no market for a good sound. Why? Because they didn't want good voices. Good voices inspire people. And inspired people are dangerous. They think. They have dis discrimination. They even know which products they want to buy and which ones they don't want to buy. Here's a very interesting quote from Boris Kristof. He saw this coming very early. He said, take this very expensive competition I'm involved with here in Paris, with young people from all over the world. They have to sing Ravel and Poulenc, No Verdi or Puccini, with the exception of two very fine black Americans in these three days, I haven't heard one timbre that impressed me. Does this depend on faulty teaching? Or has the idea of personality gone so that all of these voices sound alike? If the directors and conductors are responsible for what is taking place, the main fault lies with the people who are running the opera houses without the necessary preparation and who no longer respect composers, librettists, and art in general. Singers do not stand up to them as money is more important to them. To please von Karajan, at one time I even went so far as to accept to sing Romfis for him, a part for which I had no sympathy. The soprano was a beautiful black woman, but I could not hear her. I asked the conductor, von Karajan, how we could reach opening night with an inaudible protagonist. And do you know what he replied? She looks the part, so we shall just have to forget the rest. He says, a view I could not share. I interviewed Jerome Hines five days before his 72nd birthday because he had retained his voice and I wanted to ask what Mr. Hines thought about Kristoff's appraisal. Mr. Hines put it very succinctly. He said, let me put it this way. I won't try to imitate his voice, but I had to do that. We are facing a generation of young singers who are much more diminutive in their approach to singing. I will sing King Mark with a Tristan who I feel should be doing Alma Viva. I asked Mr. Hines, can you describe the difference in the way singers sounded when you were coming into the business 50 years ago and how they sound now? Mr. Hines responded, Yes, when I came to the Met, I'll stop doing that now, Robert Merrill and Leonard Warren sounded more like basses than most of the basses you hear today. Take Lawrence Tibbet. He had a big world-class sound. It was a richer, heavier far by sound than, excuse me, it was a richer, heavier sound by far than what you hear from a baritone today. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? That it's not the fact that only great voices show up once every century or two or three. It's the fact we've been sold that bill of goods in a planted, intentional coup to change the nature of opera, as well as change the nature of education. An anti-intellectual program conducted by the leading corporations in the world.
an anti-art campaign conducted by the same people. You don't have to believe me. You don't have to believe the New York Times. You don't have to believe Peter Davis, the great critic. You can read it all in Noam Chomsky's book, Requiem for the American Dream. It's also been a requiem for opera as we knew and loved it. John Vickers came here to Vancouver a few years before after he had retired. He came here and he received uh, an honorary doctor's degree because he actually had attended the University of British Columbia where I taught many years ago. And so the university gave him an honorary degree and uh, the head of our faculty had lunch with him and asked him you still have your voice, people tell me. Why did you retire from opera so soon when you could still sing? And he told our director, he said, opera had moved so far in the direction of just entertaining an audience that I didn't think I had any place in it anymore. And the director was not competent enough to, to understand what he'd been told. He told me later, he thought, oh, I just thought it was an old man with sour grapes. You can see what a moron that he was. Vickers was explaining that opera has never been great entertainment and was never constructed that way. If you want entertainment, you better go to Broadway, or even that now you won't find very entertaining. But it used to be you could go to Broadway. And maybe you could find a plenty a funny play on Broadway if you want entertainment. Oh, or you could stay at home and watch TV if you want entertainment. Opera had always been a part of music which was composed to inspire people, to elevate people, to raise people up. In Vickers' own words, he sang to inspire an audience to ask for themselves the great questions of life. What is truth? What is beauty? And he says, the artist cannot give the answer to those questions, but the artist is very good at bringing those questions up to the general audience, to mankind, through his art. He said, it might be worth my singing an opera if I could only inspire maybe one or two in the audience. Now there is a serious form, a serious understanding of what opera is and what it was made for since the beginning of the 1500s and sponsored by the nobility, sponsored by the uh, rich people of that day who have gone against it now because they wish to control the kind of person in society who buys their products, who is an empty-minded consumer who can be driven along by the propaganda of commercials and media pressure and social pressure and a new form of, of Windows comes out. Oh, we all have to buy it. Windows 12 just came out. We've all got to get it. Let's go. You see, this is the kind of people they wanted to create as the average person in society. And this kind of person is not really interested in art. In art, you have to have more than the attention span of a gnat. In art, you have to seek in order to find. 
you have to develop discrimination. You need to be aware of history. You need to care about history. And you certainly need to have an inquiring mind which can be moved by Mozart or Verdi or Puccini or Wagner. Who has that kind of a mind now? Who's stuck to TV? Who's stuck to the internet? And if he goes to see an opera, he won't care about the quality of the singers he sees on stage. And he'll be stuck reading the translation, which is printed now across the proscenium in big letters. You see, this is the death of opera. And this is the kind of dead society which Noam Chomsky talks about as an orchestrated society, a constructed society, an anti-intellectual society, an anti-art society. That's why they said here in the article, clear back in 1980, that the talents are there, but the circumstances in the music world are not there to promote, to promote great talent. And that is the reason why they're not there. They're not sought for. They're discouraged if they're found. No market for a good voice today, Marilyn Horne said. Well, I think that it's a little bit for you to chew on. And maybe you ought to go back to your records of, of Tobaldi and Delmonico and Siepi, Totsi, Hein, Heinz, Christoph, uh, Di Stefano, Bergonzi, and listen to great singing for a while. And recall in your mind what it is. And maybe you can even relax a little bit and see how those great singers inspired you even when listening to them on a record. And if you can do that, if you can remember, then we may be able to survive this era in history, come out on the other side of it, and create a new renaissance of value. There is at least that possibility. Thank you for listening.